All right, welcome everyone to today's uh, episode of Peak. We are joined by Alex Eric Aronson, who is a good um, good colleague and uh, old friend of ours, um, of Surge's and mine. Um, he went to the University of West Georgia and uh, did his master's there um, and has very strong interests in Lacanian psychoanalysis and is also a practicing counselor at the moment. So um, today we're just hoping to uh, get his insights on, on human transformation and um, uh, questions of just more broadly human psychology um, uh, that are informed by his theoretical interests and knowledge and also his uh, practical experience. So um, Alex, why don't I hand the mic over to you and just let you introduce yourself and then when you're ready, share some thoughts on human transformation. Sure. Well, Gary, Suraj, Gil, it's uh, very nice to be here. I'm here in the in the lineage of, of of guests that are probably greater than I am, but I'm, you know, honored to be here today. Um, Gary, you, you already said kind of the you know the the thing that's uh, probably most interesting about me is the interest in psychoanalysis. I have been uh, practicing as a counselor, a clinician of some kind for on and off for about five or six years now, uh, with a psychoanalytic sort of inflection informing my work, you know, just to be fair to the, the, the real deal Lacanians out there, I'm not in formation, I'm not affiliated with a school currently, I do some work with a, with a school in Colorado, but uh, I have, let's say I've tried to adopt the psychoanalytic uh, ethos in my work, and uh, I've, I've found that to be very ritually rewarding. Uh, I guess I, I would say that I have some outside pursuits too, in terms of uh, some independent study of object-oriented ontology, of accelerationism, and uh, you know, sort of broadly broadly interested in in critique and examination of, of postmodernity and contemporary sort of uh, situations arising from globalism and the, the global economy. Oh, interesting. Okay, so there, there's there's I mean we're already at a kind of <clears throat> excuse me crossroads here. Um, should we talk about the um, your interests in critiquing postmodernity um, and and that end of it, or should we maybe we should stick with the other bit of it first? Um, sure. Closer to your work, at least for the moment, and we we could sort of circle back to the other topic later. But um, in the interest of catching up our viewers on all this terminology, uh, maybe just give us a sense of. Um, what do you see as the defining features of psychoanalysis and psychoanalytic um, practice? Mm. So give us a sense of the kind of work that it is that you're sure. up to. Sure. Well, I would say for those who are familiar with uh, Freud, you know, the founder of this discipline, I try to cleave pretty closely to, to Freudian principles. That means that in my work, as one client said, you just sit there stone-faced and you don't say anything. That's not exactly true. But that is a part of my work. Uh, I take, in the psychoanalytic tradition, I take very seriously what is said. Um, the, what, what you might say distinguishes psychoanalytic work is it listens to what is said rather than what is meant. And uh, I would say that's, that's, that may be the, the, the most succinct way of talking about the specific bent of psychoanalysis, if that makes sense. That's great. Why don't we spend a little time unpacking that, actually? What is the difference between uh, what is meant versus what is said that's relevant to psychoanalytic practice, mm. the process itself? Sure. Well, in the process, in listening to what is said, sometimes rather than what is meant, not, you know, not that there's a disregard for meaning, but there's an assumption that, that meaning may be sort of ephemeral. It may be something that develops along the way. Um, in listening to what is said, you're, you're listening to what is speaking in the client that is more than the client, in the analysis that is more than the analysis. Because of course, the, the fundamental assumption of psychoanalysis is that the unconscious exists. You know, and probably already someone would take me to task saying the unconscious exists. Some people would, would contest that. But broadly, what you're listening for is the speaking of the unconscious. You were listening to, you're attempting to detect what it is that, that, that your client or your analyst, whoever you want to speak about them, what they, what they do not know that they know. And of course, the famous Donald Rumsfeld 
you know, quadrilogy may come to mind, known knowns, known unknowns, so on and so forth. These are the, these are the unknown knowns. I would say that's a, that's a, a pretty, pretty good way to get at it. And so you're listening for what the, you know, what the speaker knows about themselves without being able yet to acknowledge it. Right. Um, yeah. The unconscious. So yeah. it's kind of like maybe to give like a visual um, sort of imagistic metaphor here uh, to, to work with, right? Um, the, the, the Freudian insight was that there's more to me than I think there is. And everything else that there is to me than what I think there is, is also acting on me and motivating me and influencing myself. Um, in ways that elude my own understanding, reflective self-understanding, rather. Perfectly, perfectly said, yes. And so th there's like, there's like your ego, right? Your conscious self, we can say. And then there's all of the other parts of you that can be thought of as personalities with their own uh, emotional, motivational, cognitive, affective, et cetera, um, valences and, and propensities that influence you. That uh, if you're not aware of them that doesn't mean that they don't exist or that they're not acting on you but precisely that they do exist and they are acting on you except that you're realizing that and so you're kind of in the dark as to what it is that's even motivating you or driving you to be what it is that you're being um Absolutely. so as you're listening to not just what is meant but what is said is the idea there that uh it's through speak through or maybe in a, in, in a sense through unintended speech, right? Because you might say something and mean something else, right? Um, so in, in meaning one thing, but actually saying another, you could make the argument on psychoanalytic grounds that uh, that's where the person's unconscious is actually revealing itself in these little, um, through these little like emergencies, so to speak. And if yes. you hear it out like that, you can, start to right, untangle whatever it is that's also there um, that they're not aware of. And, and, and what happens if you, if you do that? That's my question. Well, and it's, it's, a, great, it's a great summary and a great, great question. And I like this emergencies uh, as a sort of, you know, a double meaning there of emergence and also emergency. It's very, that's a very Lacanian formulation, actually, Gary. That's a wonderful neologism um, <laughs> or a wonderful double meaning. The, you know, what, what you, what you can begin to do when you develop an ear, and that's, this is a big part of why so many analysts become analysts, because once you start hearing this way, you, you don't go back. When you can hear that there is something with its own telos for your life, there is something speaking through you. The, of course, one of the famous examples is like, if you're, if you're riding the horse, are you the master of the horse or is the horse taking you where, you, where the horse would like to go? And the sort of great mistake is to imagine that you are in charge of the horse. At some level, you are at the horse's mercy, you know? And when you listen for these unintended, uh, you know, unintended sayings, this unintended speaking, you can begin to acknowledge that perhaps the ways in which you perpetually or perennially frustrate or subvert yourself has to do just with that battle between the horse and the rider. You know, that you, that you become aware that there is something in you that's going somewhere where you do not intend. And you can either live a, a very sort of rigid and controlled life that attempts to, to, you know, really just attempts to pretend that that's not happening. Or you can acknowledge that it isn't and let your curiosity guide you to what that other agenda, which is working within you, might be. This is so, God, maybe, it, I know what's going on with me. I'm feeling particularly attuned and sensitive. And so like what you're saying is really resonating with me. And I feel like- I know why, let me jump in. Um, actually, I have a question for both of you, Gary and Alex. Uh, I know in your practice, you have to, in your cl clinical practice, you have to uh, uh, listen carefully. You have to practice this uh, very specific listening. How do you learn to do that? Because for me, it's almost you have to go through a transformation uh, in yourself uh, even before uh, being able to do your job. 
So how, how do you uh, learn that? Well, there's, there's, there's two ways. And I'll say that I'm in my own analysis now as of about six months. And that has accelerated this, this, this process of developing that ear. Prior to that, you know, there's, a, there's a, an enormous body of psychoanalytic literature on technique, on practice. And you can kind of, you know, I think you can understand psychoanalysis through that in the same way that you have to understand how an airplane works to fly a plane. You know, you can have that kind of technical knowledge and you can catch a lot of things that way. And if you're already a sort of maybe linguistically interested or inclined person, you can be attuned to those, to those double meanings or the ways that a sentence can be heard differently, things like that. Um, but until someone catches you in your own analysis, until someone really, really nails you, you know, it's hard to understand effectively how that can be, which is really important too, because you don't, you know, you want to be an ally to your client. You don't want to, you know, be wielding, wielding a hammer of your, of your knowledge or technique, but uh, there's just, there's really no substitute for becoming very familiar with all of the ways Maybe this is maybe I'm maybe I'm a little too long-winded here, but what you can do before you enter analysis is you can become familiar with the ways in which certain modes of speaking seem to defend against their own double meaning, or even even more than double meaning, but let's say their own polyvalence. And so certain ways of, you know, what's a what's an easy example? An unprovoked denial. I would never want so and so to die in a car accident. You know. Why would it even occur to someone to say that? And then other strange formulations like, I love them to death, things like that. <laughs> and of course, there are the obvious, the Freudian slips. Um, the, uh, you know, if you, get, if you get an ear for those things, you can start to, you can start to be curious about what's like, what is subaltern? What is the, what is the hidden sort of telos that, that is being enacted through, through that speaking? Does, does that answer your question, Gil? That, that's, um, I, I love the question. I love your answer and I want to add something to it and then let's see what happens after that. Um, what I was wanting to say is that there's something, there's something inherently paradoxical about human nature and human consciousness mm -hmm. and that someone might say one thing and then do another altogether. And I, I think these kinds of, um, linguistic emergencies that we're looking out for in the clinical setting, they, 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 they're a way of tracking these paradoxes of, of the self, actually. Um, it, it's in these paradoxes, right? In these paradoxical moments that the unconscious sort of lurks and is at odds with the conscious self. Yeah. And uh, if I were to add anything to that already very well-formulated answer, it'd be that um, it's actually something that I... Uh, I think we were all taught at, at West Georgia in our time there. I, I'm not, I mean, I'm sure you at least heard it once or twice in the hallways, in the corridors of Melson Hall, right? Uh, the ABCs of psychology, mm -hmm. affect before content. Mm -hmm. right? it, it's not quite what's being said that always matters, but how it's being said, the, the, affective, the affective content that's being conveyed, not just the propositional content. And so... Uh, yeah, but, I mean, um, I'm wondering what you think of that, um, and it's 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 sort of. Let, let me pause there just for a moment and, and just see what you guys think um, of the paradox part and then the affect before content part. Sure. Would anybody like to? I, something comes to mind for me for that. Would anybody else like to to jump in? I would just say that um, while we're distinguishing between what's meant and what's said, we we are sort of getting at the whole point of interpretation, which is, you know, and I've been guilty of this in my own life. Um, we can either just take people at their word and there might be a sort of uh, perceived nobility or virtue to that saying, you know, I'm, I'm not going to read too far into it. Uh, but on the other hand, it's like, even if you believe that that's the right thing to do, it might not serve your interests. It might not serve their interests. Ultimately, it might be a sort of um, 
oh, but I wish I could read into it because then I could read into all sorts of things that maybe I want to read into it or maybe I could project myself onto it. So there's there's this kind of, uh, there's, I, I guess this art of interpretation needs to be kept in mind. It has to be a skill that's owned and sort of um, interpreting people in the right way and, you know, like kind of sometimes putting yourself aside and, and being aware of the ways that you might unconsciously project onto people while you're doing that. Um, I, I think that's all important to keep in mind too. Yeah. That's, I think that's very important. And that I think, in fact, what you're saying is, is really essential. And this, this Gil, this kind of gets back to your question about learning this process. It can be tempting, at least I know this temptation in myself, it can be tempting to hear every double entendre, every slip of the tongue, every sort of mixed metaphor as indicative of, oh, there's the unconscious, there's the unconscious. And you can kind of be like somebody who, you know, you want, you want every, every shot you take is a shot, every shot you don't try is a, is a shot that you effectively miss. And you can be in that mindset. I've bungled that phrase, but maybe you're familiar with what I'm talking about. Um, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, is that it? Um, as you can tell, I'm a big sports guy. But um, you can be in that mindset where every time you hear something that could be indicative of the, the presence of the unconscious, you, you, kind of, you kind of go crazy with that. And you can definitely be in that mindset. I've been in that mindset myself while learning. And you can kind of confuse your client with that because you do want to have a read on them. And Gary, when you talk about affect before content, I will push back a little bit, just very gently, that psychoanalysis, in psychoanalysis, tracking affect, at least as I understand it, tracking affect is not always as important. But what you can perhaps be in contact with in yourself is the way in which the content could point to um, a different possible affective expression. So Freud would say that affect cannot be repressed, but that representation I believe, and someone's going to excoriate me on this, but representation and, and words can be repressed. And so you can ask yourself, using that ABC sort of rubric, if these words were heard differently, would they point to a different affective experience? And I think that could be a good compass. That could be a good guide. That's great. It's also a, a kind of imaginative exercise, right? Mm -hmm. You're flexing your imaginative muscles. Yes, absolutely. And in doing that, you're training your interpretive skills to be more flexible and more, um, I mean, literally more imaginative in, in how to take, to be able to take other people's words. And uh, I, I think the reason now, as I look back, the reason why I brought in the ABCs of psychology thing, the affect before content is because that points to a thing that the humanistic psychologists talk about, um, right? Especially Rogers, incongruence. Mm -hmm. uh, part of what you're looking for in your work uh, with clients is um, these incongruences between what they say and how they actually show up. Yes. And so th th I guess this, this could be seen as the inverse of the psychoanalytic sort of formulation where um, besides right, meaning one thing and then ending up saying another, you could be saying one thing, but the meaning is actually different. And so th that's a way in which that your words could belie your own meanings. Yes, yes. Which I don't know if that's the opposite or if that's just a different version of the same thing. Because like what, what you might, like somebody might come and say to you that, you know, my, my best friend, for example, um, just didn't get into... I don't know, grad school or, or, or something like that. And they can say, I'm feeling very sad about it in a way that doesn't actually seem sad. Mm -hmm. So there's an incongruence between right, what they're saying that they're expressing versus what they're actually expressing. And that, that might be one thing that could point to right, um, yeah. what it is that's, that might be going on in their personal world that they're withholding from, from you in that case or from others. That maybe they uh, were maybe saw their friend as a sort of rival and a part of them was actually happy and not sad that their friend didn't get into, right, uh, into grad school, for example. I'm, I'm just, um, yeah. Well, yeah, I, th I think you're exactly right. And psychoanalysis, you know, is not clairvoyance. You're definitely working from a mental construct of the client. And something that I've found to be, you know, there's a, you know, r rightly or wrongly, that you can sort of take as your North Star the idea that there is a 
secondary benefit. You know, psychoanalysis has been accused of being cynical, and perhaps it is. But one way to begin your inquiry might be to might be to suggest, you know, okay, as in your example, your friend didn't get in, but as I get to know who you are, maybe I get the impression that you protest too much. You know, you're you're a little you're a little sadder about this than some other things that you have said would indicate. Maybe, as you said, this friend is actually more of a rival. And you feel, you feel a need to profess your sadness, so it's not really what you're feeling. And in the course of my work with you, that might emerge as a theme that, for instance, you actually feel quite rivalrous. You're very aggressive towards the people around you, and that you're compensating for that by holding yourself back or being a little more kind than you'd actually like to be. Does that does that feel like that's getting at something? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, we're we're exploring these different possibilities as mm -hmm. to how it, it could play out in the in the clinic. So yeah. it seems like what's important what's an important part of the process is thematization of uh, patterns. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you could say a little more about that. Um, what what it means to thematize unconscious patterns and to bring them into the conversation. And what that might look like when it goes well, whatever that means in the clinical mm. setting. What a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, the thematization makes me think that, you know, I think, in, I think it would be a, a fair characterization of, of, of Lacan to say that what is elsewhere, you know, called personality in Lacanian psychoanalysis might be called the symptom. So the, 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 the warp and woof of one's mode of expression, you know, the thing that sort of marks you as you is the same thing that also frustrates you, you know? The, the personality is something that, uh, I don't want to say is self-subverting, but that, that adherence to that personality comes with its own limitations. It comes with a, a sort of consolation prize, uh, which is, you know, what is sometimes, sometimes called the secondary gain, which, it, which is something that it aims at, that it's been trained to or bent towards that uh, can make you feel just a little bit uh, askew from your own from your own vision of how you might like your life to be. So is that sort of the my greatest strength is also my greatest weakness thing? Like the, the very things that I pride myself for, let's say, might actually also be simultaneously the very things that uh, bring me suffering in my life in, in ways that um, I might not be aware of. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be an, an excellent way to say it. Yes. What would an example, a good example, be? You think? Gee, well, I have had, speaking very broadly, uh, a clinical example comes to mind uh, of a person who was exceptionally gracious. I think I would say exceptionally self-effacing. And that in many ways, this, uh, you know, this, this was key to a lot of this person's successes, but uh, that the, 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 they were so finely, this ability of theirs was so finely honed that were they to encounter a situation where, you know, being gracious, being self-effacing, allowing themselves to be in second place, where that could not occur, they would actually protest, they, they would engineer the situation so that they would maintain that spot, you know, if that makes sense. And in fact, you can, you can become quite masochistic, you know, you can, you can go from, you can go from benevolent and, and helpful and kind to actually masochistic and actually transform the people around you into persecutory figures in order to continue to be the person that you feel that you ought to be. Mm, okay, can I read into this a little bit and then? Yeah, uh, absolutely, please. Yeah, yeah I'm, not, I'm not sure if that conveys it or not, but. I, I, think, I think I have a sense of what you're uh, conveying with that. So what I'm imagining is someone who um, resists taking up positions of authority and resists adopting like full power in a sense, or as much power as they actually can if they were to take it on more fully, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, they're, I, it's kind of like, if I were to 
because if I were to take first place, that would mean that I'm recognizing that in some sense, I'm the best that there is. And there's something that's, yes, on the one hand, like empowering about that, but it's also a little scary. And maybe there, there might be some shame that comes along with it. Like if, if I take on all that power, right. If I, if I uh, confess this and admit it and uh, announce it to the world in this way, then um, what kind of a person am I like? Mm. Um, so yeah. I, I wonder if there might be something like that going on um, that right in trying so hard to resist, um, to avoid actually um, that shame, the shame that comes along with being in the number one spot, the person might actually go out of their way and um, do things that are destructive uh, with respect to themselves and others. And then the question then would be like, what would those things look like? But mm. yes, if I if I'm as competent as I can be, if I'm as aggressive and assertive as I can be, who will I be surpassing? Will I? What what rule or boundary will I be violating? And in what way is the is the thing that apparently limits me also the thing that gives structure, consistency, and identity to my life? And the the I think the thing that can be difficult about psychoanalysis is that it can appear almost as if you're asking people to, to go against their own moral compass, even at times, because you have to, you have to, you know, it can be a sort of a relativizing process. It can be one in which you have to see that the thing that you pride yourself on is not only the thing that you, that you limit yourself with, but the thing that you limit and instrumentalize others with too. Yeah. The paradox of the self again, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the nature of, of being a human self. Yeah, and that's I mean that's kind of the I mean that's kind of the evil of of the of the personality is that you know who you are and others know who you are and damn it you're going to do whatever you have to to keep things that way. You know it, it's very much a, a kind of a circuit of satisfaction and a, a self reifying process. And to, so, to break someone out of that can, can be really very difficult. So let, let's assume just for argument's sake that, you know, you, you've been, you are that, let's say we're the person that we were just describing this hypothetical example. And we've been going to uh, analysis for, I don't know, for argument's sake, like 10 years. All right. Mm -hmm. So it's been like an intense and, and long winded process. And I mean, I've, I've discovered all sorts of daddy issues that I didn't mm -hmm. even know I had and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, things are getting like really oof, just oof, hot. Um, but then I'm like, I, I get to that point where it's like, oh my God, this is what's been happening all this time. And I have that aha moment, that profound, right, insight that promises to change me and my personality and my life altogether. Mm -hmm. So my question right now to you would be, is that even a proper characterization of, 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 of the kind of transformation that does end up taking place through, through this process? Or um, is there a sense in which we do get these profound insights through this process that do transform us? And if so, then how? How, how could I imagine myself being different at the end of such a process? Well, I, I have recourse here to the, the sort of maybe well-known Freudian theorem. Uh, where it was, I must become. So where where this thing was that was that was giving me, you know, was reifying my identity, that was determining the contours of my relationships, I must assume that this thing is an inalienable part of myself. And so once you, you know, once you do that, at least at least the question can begin to be posed: Do you want to continue to do that? sort of in the, in the naive way, the unconscious way that you have been doing it, or would you like to be able to take that up differently? And so you may never, you know, so I, think, I think some schools or some branches would say that you may never separate yourself from that entirely, but you may struggle with it differently. And if, uh, you know, psychoanalysis is very concerned with destiny and, you know, as, as Freud said, better to go down in a fair fight with destiny. Um, Wait, could you 
Say that again. I want to get it down. Yeah, Freud, Freud had said better to go down in a fair fight with destiny. And so if there is something in you which is bent to a specific end, which when you start psychoanalysis, it doesn't feel like you, you know, it's maybe you have a sense that it's in there, but it doesn't feel like you, you want to get rid of it, you want to, you know, live your best life, whatever. There may be something in that circuit of your satisfactions, which which you never quite do away with. But the idea is that if you know about it, if you're aware of it, then you might, you might live it differently. You might live it a little more comfortably. So it's as much as it is about transcendence, it's also, it is about destiny. It is about assuming one's identity. Um, though it is not the identity that you believe that you, you know, that you, that you had consciously, you know? And I, I wonder, I wonder if that makes sense. I, I mean, for me, I know that it does make sense. Um, mm. I don't know if Gil and Serge have any any thoughts or feedback. I, yeah, I'd like please, to, yeah, yeah. Because I'm bursting with like with so much right now, but I'll I'll withhold it for now. I'm a little more Jungian in my orientation, just by uh, the way I came across certain theorists. Um, I came across Carl Jung much earlier in my scholarly career um, and, and and Jung has this idea of the unconscious being what we well so Jung has a couple of things the first thing is that to go along with destiny or fate Jung said that uh, as long as we remain ignorant of the unconscious and how it's guiding us uh, we're slaves to it um, and so then that brings me to okay, so I want to understand the unconscious um, or perhaps I want to understand the id. Um, but on the other hand, I, I, I don't know if that means transcending it so much as maybe transcending and incorporating it into my actual self and reality. Um, because then the other danger would be um, to believe that we could transcend the superego, mm -hmm. you know, to transcend like the voice that's, and I, I think there, there's, there might be something to that, not to be a super moral agent, but to kind of almost get over the super ego at the same time and recognize, okay, you know, I'm human, I have limitations, and I can't just be a slave to everything the super ego dictates because I have this id over here that's whining in my ear. Mm -hmm. And so there's sort of a bringing together. I, I guess I don't have a problem saying that I want to transcend both of those in favor of the ego. Um, but I think the, the danger with saying I want to transcend the superego is like, I want to wrestle with my sense of morality because I want to be better than it. And then that's just like the superego winning ultimately, right? It, it's like, it's getting its way in that case. It's like, yeah, you do want to be better than me because I'm telling you to be. It's, it's, so I think there could be a potential neurosis there um, in either direction of, of uh, just succumbing purely to the its desires or... Mm -hmm. Um, thinking, yeah, you know, I'm going to do better than super ego. I'm going to be like, I'm going to be this like, uh, pan religious, like super demigod type of person. And it's just like, no. So. Yeah. What you, what you're saying is very interesting. I think it's important to remember that, you know, at least for Freud, the, the ego and uh, excuse me, the id and the super ego are, are derived of the same stuff. You know, the, the super ego is just a sort of the sophisticated violence of the id. Mm. You know, it's just the sort of, it's the, it's the <laughs> you know, like it's the, it's the, it's the boot stepping I've on never, the neck I've of never humanity. Heard of it. I've um, never yeah. heard it said that way. That's amazing. It's yeah, I hadn't way. either. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I remember this, this insight very clearly of, of realizing that the same thing that tells you what, what not to do also tells you what you should do. And so there's not, and there's not really a question of, of becoming other than neurotic, I think. There's a, there's a question of reorienting your, yourself or your awareness. And this is where it becomes tricky because I, don't, I, I also don't believe that the ego can be understood as like an independent faculty, nor do I believe that in psychoanalysis there is free will. Like I, I really don't believe that there's free will. And one of the, one of the creepiest things that was ever you know, dropped in my lap was the understanding that you don't know what word you're going to produce next as you're speaking. Even if you pause to speak, 
what is the agent of that reflection? What, what is it, what comes to you as you pause to reflect? It's always sort of ex nihilo, it's coming from where you cannot see it and you're only understanding it afterwards. And so what you can achieve in psychoanalysis, and I'm, I'm sure someone is seething as I say this, but what I think you can achieve in psychoanalysis is that if your, if your, if your attitude before analysis was like, oh, well, I'll only ever inhale. I'll never exhale. I don't want to do that. That's not part of my process. I'll only inhale, but not exhale. <laughs> After analysis, you realize you must inhale and exhale. And that's, that's an example I like because it's so, it gets, it's so close to you. It's so much in you that you can be more, you know, you can sort of, you can sort of not experience it always just as this, as this awful disruptive intrusion you know, against your will, but that there, you know, I think also there will always be a way in which it is, you know, it, it has, it has an agenda for you that you can never really know. You can recognize it retroactively and you can become more comfortable with that. And what I often see with my clients is that they become, um, for lack of a better word, they become a little more verbose. They speak a little more easily. They express themselves a little more easily. They are surprised by themselves rather than shocked or appalled at themselves. Um, I will, you know, I will always think back very fondly to my client that, uh, you know, sort of became very interested in his poetic capacities in the course of our work. Not because he became like a more effective operator or something, but because he could understand, he could be a little less aggravated by himself. You know, he could be a little more ready to be surprised by himself and even to take delight in that. So what is that? I'm going to make a rhetorical move here, actually. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious what you'll think. Because mm -hmm. you, you made the claim that you don't believe in free will in the analytic process. No. But to me, everything you're describing, I see that as the process of freeing one's will mm -hmm. from its unconscious shackles, allowing someone to be more fully themselves and to relax as they speak and to be ready to be surprised at even their own selves. So, so there's a kind of freedom that does come along with that rather than a sense of constraint or restrictedness. Um, I'll, I'll meet you halfway and I'll say that between the horse and the rider, perhaps some natural, some natural affection can develop, you know, or some, <laughs> some attunement between the horse and the rider so that you're not the guy whipping the horse and the horse is bucking you off and, Maybe you can get there, but I don't, I think maybe, and maybe this was one of the significant struggles of, of sort of the way of thinking of our, of, of our time is that we are conscious agents selecting the best things for ourselves and, or, you know, sort of contractually um, engineering our satisfaction. And I think that that is kind of the, the great lie of the contemporary moment is that we are uh, rational agents choosing the best for ourselves and that we can always have our happiness. And I, I do think that is an illusion for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say that any notion of free will that's grounded in the conception of the self as fully rational or essentially rational in that sense doesn't exist. Or at the very least that there's good reason to believe that it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. But rather if, if at least for me, if I were to try to make a case for free will, I would want to do it in a way that's actually psychoanalytically grounded and mm -hmm. uh, consistent with the principles that we've been articulating through this discussion. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think freedom is where you keep acting in ways that are opposed to who it is that you actually are. Mm -hmm. To the degree that there is something that you actually are or ways in which that you actually are that transcend your desire to be one way or another mm -hmm. right and, and that's the idea right that you're not a unified subject you're a split subject you, you have all sorts of motivational forces that are pulling and pushing at you from all sorts of di different directions that aren't necessarily coherent with one another and i think that again to to, to, to use that um i guess image as um in the service of making my point, freedom isn't when one force amongst all the, the, the plurality of forces that are there uh, reigns over all of them and uh, subjects them to its dominion. 
but rather when there's a kind of coherence that's established between all of these forces that's dialectical in nature mm -hmm. and that's free in how in how and to the degree which it's able to bring all these different parts into the conversation mm -hmm. which brings us back to the question of speech and the function of speech in an, in analysis right what is it that we choose um, or are even able to bring into speech in the context of our own lives. Um, that's, that's so really what do you think said. of that? I, I, think that's, I think that's really nicely said. I do have, I have some thoughts about that. Um, Suraj, I want to I ask you if you feel that, you know, I, I did not mean to trample your question or to no. dismiss it. No, no, okay. it's fine. Sure, because, because, you know, there are some divergences between you know, uh, Freudian and Lacanian psychoanalysis and Jungian psychoanalysis. And I think the, the sticking point probably would be that, and I say this as someone way more ignorant of Jung than I have any right to be, but that, that Jung would say that in the process of the incorporation of these unconscious forces, you become a more complete ego. And that could be totally off. That could be totally off. So I, 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 I ask you if that has, you know, anything to do with your understanding. I see. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I think you're representing Jung's view well there. Um, and I think you would basically call that individuation or um, the, perhaps the fulfillment of personality, because for Jung, personality really was uh, what results from recognizing these archetypes or unconscious forces. For Jung, it was the archetypes more than uh, unconscious forces, I would say. Um, and, and balancing them with one's conscious self or ego. Uh, so that's, that's really personality for, for Jung. Um, and I think that if we're on the topic of free will, for me, and as a Jungian, for me, it's more of, um, I've always been a bit of a compatibilist. Well, not always, but I try to be ultimately, right? That's where I settle um, with free will and determinism. And um, it, it, there's a couple of things I'm going to bring up here. I'm going to stay on the Freudian Jungian route for a bit, but then I want to go to Lacan for a bit just to um, get your take on something. But um, it seems to me that if the ego is between the super ego and the id, um, I always view the id as, at least in my own life, more of the deterministic constraining factor in the sense of yeah, it, it opens you up to all sorts of things, but those things kind of ultimately can become chains to your existence too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, desire basically. Um, on the other hand, the superego is this thing that's perhaps viewed as sort of constraining and like strict and, and it, it makes you more rigid morally. But on the other hand, uh, when you do the right thing, there's a sense of freedom. Uh, like I did the right thing. So regardless of what happens now, it's, you know, things are gonna be for the best. Um, but the other thing I want to I want to ask you about is this very basic idea of Lacan's unconscious as structured as a language. Um, that's an idea I came across uh, in my undergraduate, and admittedly, it was in a sort of like comic book uh, trying to explain Lacan, and that's the phrase that kept coming up: the unconscious. I, I know, I know the book you're talking about. It's great. Book. You know that one, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, an art history professor lent that to me. And I remember I was in a philosophy class studying David Hume and I was at the front row and the professor saw that book and he was like, oh, that's disgusting. He was like, you know, this classic kind of empiricist, kind of like snubbing, you know, the kind of more obscure Lacanian stuff. But, but, sure. but, but the idea of the unconscious being structured as a language is very interesting to me. Um, Number one, because uh, Lacan was a very linguistically adept person. And so I'm not sure that he ever said the unconscious is structured as a language like outright that way. But I'm just wondering, in, in all of your work, in all of your analysis, um, how, how has that idea um, stood up? Has it stood up at all? What a cool question. Um... I would say I would say it absolutely has stood up, and I, though my, you know, this idea that unconscious is structured like a language, this seems to me like the kind of thing that you know, someone is writing the fiftieth book about, and it still hasn't been entirely articulated. You know, this is a this is a big idea. I would say that 
I understand it as structured like a language in the sense that in language, and I'm, I'm no linguist here, but in a language, language, a language can operate because words interrelate, right? One word ha has, a, has a meaning that can be, that, it, that is brought out by its relationship to other words and their meanings. And this is a, you know, it's a big idea in psychoanalysis that things are understood retroactively in the same way that a sentence makes sense when you get to the end of it, right? And so you might say that in the unconscious, and again, someone is probably just apoplectic right now, just, I, I could be getting this totally wrong, but in the unconscious, in a sense, the, the sentence, if you will, has already been punctuated. That is for the neurotic subject, the meaning of something is already set in the unconscious. And so you encounter what they, what they call master signifiers. And I've certainly found this to be you know, the case for a number of my clients. The deeper you get, the more you tend to run into these enigmatic words, which, which not, they, they both make sense of experience, but they constrain experience. And so you find these words which, which do not have a rich interrelation with other possible words. They're very fixed. They're basically, they're command words, you might say. And so as you hone in on these words, you try to see the ways in which they might actually have surprising other relations with other words. They might not mean just what in the unconscious they mean. They may not anchor things always as they have you know, up to that time in the life of the subject. And so what you're, what you're, kind, what, you know, what you're, what you're looking to do, and this is a big focus in Lacan, is to hear the polyvalence hear the metaphor, hear the double meaning of words, so that these words, which have, in a sense, too much power, can become regular words, words that simply exist and that can continue to flow along in the great stream of, of words and the great stream of speaking and language. And I wonder if that, if, that, if that answers or maybe that just brings more questions. I think that helps, thanks. Um, the association of, between words and words mm -hmm. that, um, might be used uh and, and and yeah they do punctuate they they do um seem to punctuate our reality and perception of things um and i would say just just quickly i, I bet you have more to say but i would say quickly gil to your question about sort of matriculating into psychoanalysis thinking like an analyst humor is really a wonderful sort of training ground there you know because what is what is a comedian or a humorist but someone who sees the unexpected relationship between situations, which of course is the unexpected relationship between words. And in, in psychoanalysis, there is, you know, Freud wrote an entire book on the relationship between jokes and the unconscious. And what is, a, what is, what is the most fundamental, you know, what is that without which you could have no, no other kind of humor? Probably a pun. Because what does a pun do? A pun plays on two meanings, a pun, resolves the tension of a definite meaning by flipping it, whether it be into something absurd or something meaningful, it allows you to go on talking, to go on thinking. You're not at a dead end. And perhaps uh, let me circle back to my first question, because we have talked about a lot of topics, uh, the importance and the function of speech, language, uh, free will, and uh, all of these topics from different perspectives with uh, Freud, Lacan, and Jung. Um, but um, uh, you do all of this in a clinical setting, Right. Uh, what advice would you give to, uh, like, maybe our listeners? Because it all comes back to human transformation, right? So, what advice would you give to people that want maybe to um, practice some of your? Uh, I, I'm sure, like, uh, it comes with a lot of uh, training uh, and practice, but. Uh, what, what can we implement in our daily lives to maybe try to, uh, as you said before, um, 
reorient ourselves and our awareness because we are trying to negotiate with the the id and the super ego but what tools can we have if we uh, if we are not in a clinical setting that's a good question um my first impulse is to say go to the literature you know and there's no there's no shame in, in consulting the secondary or even the tertiary literature on lacan reading original lacan in my view, is just a way to make sure that your misunderstandings or your own precious misunderstandings. It's good to have a good guide in this in this field. Um, more broadly, maybe it's interesting to start to think of things as symbolic. You know, there's been a lot of um, application of psychoanalysis to film, and so you know, if you can sort of begin to attune yourself to questions of what is this a metaphor for you know what what is this or that utterance or this or that situation what is it a metaphor for you know does it does it transform a difficult lived situation into something that can be maybe understood more broadly and I'm not sure that this is exactly the proper use of the idea of the symbolic in Lacan, but to begin to understand that certain utterances and certain gestures may be attempts to transform something that is right here into something that can be communicated elsewhere or enacted elsewhere, spoken about, sort of diffused into one's world rather than just experienced as right here. And uh, I don't, I, I don't think that's answered your question, honestly. But I think it's wonderful, actually. Why don't we spend a bit more time on it and unpack it more, concretize it? Um, sure. What I'm hearing again, going back to like the circling back to another idea that came up earlier, of, um, uh, flexing our imaginative muscles. I guess mm -hmm. what that does is it seems like it invites an attitude of um, openness and receptivity to other possible meanings that might be there that aren't immediately visible to ourselves, but might be, at least to the degree that we're not aware of them, they might be invisible meanings, invisible forces that are acting on us in, in ways that we, we're not aware of, that we don't understand, but that if we become aware of them, then something might change and our awareness might be reoriented. So um, I, I also like the, the etymology. I mean, if you think about, right, transformation and, and metaphors, right? Metaphors are tools that transform the meaning of words and concepts by creating mappings across words or concepts that weren't already there. Mm -hmm. So like you can think of what it's like to think of life as a journey, for example, right? I mean, life isn't a road literally that you walk and then you're, you're, you're walking towards your destiny. And then there's like, there's twists and twists and turns along the way. All these ways of thinking about life are metaphorical. And yet in thinking about life metaphorically as a journey, for example, uh, that ha might have a final destination. It allows us to reason about it imaginatively in ways that we couldn't have otherwise had we not taken up that metaphor. So life as a journey, it allows us to say that, wow, I've reached a dead end. I have to turn back now, right? I have to circle back to where I was before. I missed something along the way, mm -hmm. something important, or that my vehicle just broke down, my relationship, which also is a metaphor, right? It's a ship for a relation that carries you, carries you from one place to, to another. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, uh, the way I'm seeing your question or your, 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 your suggestion or recommendation, or if we want to make it even stronger, your prescription, mm -hmm. it's that we can just ask ourselves all the things that we so deeply believe in, what would it actually be like if they were otherwise than how we think they are? What would that mean for us? What would that mean to us? What would that change? And how would that affect us? How would it impact us? What would it mean if, the people that I say that I love the most, that I actually harbor some degree of resentment towards. Mm -hmm. Something that I, 
and maybe this is a way to turn it into a formula and then I'll, I'll stop after this, but maybe it's the things that we least want to admit that we should consider imaginatively first or most. And in doing that, we can expand the possible ways of uh, coming into relationship with these things so that we're at least doing it more consciously. And in the process of doing that, we might get the opportunity of turning instincts into choices. Mm -hmm. And th that's also a kind of metaphor. I, I don't mean that everything unconscious is an instinct, but it's like an instinct, right? It, you just act on it without second thought. And maybe therein lies the possibility of genuine psychological freedom. But anyway. Yeah, I, I, li I like that, Gary. Would anybody else like to like to chime in? Well, I like the metaphor of, I like you bringing the metaphor of relationship to light, that it's a ship, uh, it's a relation that's the ship. And the question is, where is it taking you? Um, I, I recently, uh, in examining my past uh, romantic relationship, I, I, thought of, I thought of the term fairy relationship. And what that meant to me is a relationship that is only really meant to bring two people to where they need to be in their lives at the next point. But then now I realize that's a little redundant. I didn't really need the fairy part in there because the relationship's already a ship, right? So I, I just, I appreciate your, um, your describing it that way. And yeah. You know, I, I think I, I like that. I like that also. Um, and I think, you know, on the, on the theme of, of, of relationships, it is, you know, it is, it is through language that, that we can, you know, that, that we connect to other people. Ultimately, if you want to be available to the people around you in a way that is other than the way that has simply come to you, the way that simply has sort of arrived from the back of your head, um, it's going to be through new words. It's going to be through new ways of speaking. And a lot of what I think, you know, the practical benefit may be is that you are able to invite other people to recontextualize certain experiences with you and, and thus to have different experiences because there are not, you know, if there are non-linguistic experiences, uh, unfortunately they're, they're incommunicable. You know, if you're, if you're having an experience that only you can have, I mean, that, that could be very edifying, very special for you in a way, but if you're going to be a part of the human community, you're going to have to be a part of the community of speaking beings. And so the, the richer, the sort of, the, the more richly you can transform your own experiences through speaking, that is the freedom that you extend to others too. You know, if we do want to talk about a role of freedom here, uh, you know, on a very basic level, you are, I don't want to say you're stepping out of, but let's say you're being dragged out of the circuit of that ego reification and identity reification. And thus, you're also removing yourself from, from that dynamic with other people and, and extending that freedom possibly to them to imagine things differently. And in terms of just the, the daily goings on of life, maybe there is something very young in there in feeling like you can differently embody the thing that is in you more than you, the thing that is the, your, your character, perhaps, or that, that calls to you. You're discovering a new facet of that character unless the people around you are, are capable of discovering a new facet of that for themselves. Alex, I'm wondering if, if you might have some uh, examples, either through people you've known or even personal examples of um, what it's like to, to be able to get into relationship with others more freely in the way that you're describing mm -hmm. and what it's like to feel stultified and, yeah. and to be lacking that sense of freedom. What, yeah. what are those two states like? Um, well, Gary, that makes me think that my, my sort of bridge from Freud to Lacan was actually Sartre or Sartre, whichever one of those is the right way to say it. Um, I was a, a big student of his in my undergraduate, and I really thought that he held the keys to, to some kind of true freedom. You know, I, I still love him, but not in the same way. Um, I still look back very fondly on that time. But there is a sense with him that one can be in bad faith, which may be a familiar term, that one can be a little too much of, of what one would like to think of oneself as being. You know, one can be a little too reified, a little too rigid. And in that, other people can only respond to you in a certain way. I mean, there's, there, you know, maybe for some people, there's a, a deeper well of characterizations than there are for others. 
But if you are only this thing and you're hellbent on being this thing, then the people around you, insofar as they don't want to recognize you as that, they can only appear as, a, as an antagonist. And that was, you know, without, without divulging too much, that was certainly a theme of my, of my early life. I know you and you know me. And furthermore, we both know that we both think this way and we're going to lock horns and that's that. You know, and there was a time when my life was very dominated by that dynamic. Yeah, uh, Sartre was a big part of my undergraduate experience. Mm. Also, um, for me, it was Sartre and Jung. They were kind of my two uh, go-to's very when I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and 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 I had a, you know, and, and Sartre is the reason I wasn't a compatibilist about free will and determinism back then is because I was was kind of hell bent on showing that we can have this what's called libertarian free will or this radical free will um and and i wrote my whole term my whole term paper on that uh trying to prove sartre right and uh there, there's just no i just again i like like you i look back on those years fondly um but you know it's the, the reality principle i think set in for me mm -hmm. after that <laughs> we could say that and I mean, I think if, if, if all you know about Sartre is that, is that in order to be free, I need others to be free, then I mean, that's, that's a valuable orientation. That's a, that's a valuable sort of signpost. So everyone just needs to get into a psychoanalysis ASAP. <laughs> or listen to our podcast. I mean, yeah, yeah. Either way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm just uh, mindful of time. It's been about an hour at this point. So uh, maybe we could just transition into the last set of questions um, for the last moment. Um, uh, and moment is an indeterminate sort of like span of time, right? So however long that takes, but um, we, we, have, we have already been, you know, exploring more and more of the personal territory of things. Um, and to, to take that even further, at this point, I'd, I'd like to ask you um, a personal, more of a personal question, uh, that if you were to travel back in time and say something to your younger self, um, what would you want to tell, tell him? Mm. What would you want him to know? I think that I would want him to know, and I'll, you know, I'll, just, I'll be very frank about this. This is one of the great struggles of my life has been that you need, you, you will learn things from other people. You are not the foundation of your own being. You have, you were brought into existence without being consulted. You have been spoken, the, the words of the other animate you and you can either resist this or, or, or not. And it's not a binary sort of like, well, you, you just stop resisting it. But you can either begin to stop resisting that in some sense. You can attempt to find some way with that. Or you can just be the monad. You can be the, you know, I gave birth to myself. I'm just, you know, I was here before God and then God showed up. You can't, you can have that attitude or, or not. And that really, you know, that to me is just, just hand in glove with psychoanalysis that the words that, the words that we use, the words that determine us are not our own words. And you have to find some sort of way of, of, of reconciling with that. Can I ask you a follow-up question on that, actually? Yeah, please, yeah. And this is the first time I've, I've been compelled to ask a follow-up question to that question mm -hmm. in all of our interviews, actually, which is interesting. But um, in light of everything that we've talked about, especially the last bit about how it's important to get into relationship with the others in our lives through the kind of language we use or are able to use. I would wanna figure that into the question itself and say, if you were to travel back in time and say all of that to your younger self, then how would you want to set up that kind of conversation? What would be the appropriate kind of intervention or, or frame uh, in which you would wanna convey or deliver that message so that it could really be heard and, and leave the, the impact that you wanted to leave? I think that I would say, and that's, a, that's an interesting, you could, you could ask that question of a lot of people and give a lot of different answers, I think. <laughs> but I would go back to my prior self and I would say, the sooner you get on board with this idea, the sooner you find some way to reconcile with this, 
the sooner you will be where I am now, capable of saying this to you. <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. I don't know why, but I love that. That's <laughs> that's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I mean, I, I I take that from the Lucanian formulation of, of sort of asking about what what will I have been for what I for who I am going to become. You know, how will I how will I reflect on myself from almost from the future into the past? And how can I how can I change the the sort of abject status of that thing that was and recognize that that is also a, a place of becoming and not a place of fixedness. Mm, so so imagine, you imagine your future self coming back to you and, and saying like, you're not going to get to where you want to be unless you're no longer what you were. So you feel like you're on the right track with yourself then? Some days, some days. More, uh, more, more yes than no. I mean, I... I, th that's the sense that I'm getting right now from that answer itself. That answer is, mm. it's very affirmative of who you are right now, the, the, the way it sounds to me. Um, cause that's the main reason that you uh, use to try to persuade your younger self to, to take that idea more seriously. If you do this, the, the sooner you do this, the sooner you'll get to where I am right now. Yeah. And that's good. Therefore, yeah, I mean, where you, I am right now, yeah. You, you kind of want to become the person that, that you used to envy or something, right? I mean, as, as kind of cynical as that may, as that may sound, but. No, that, that's, that's uh, I mean, uh, going, circling back to paradoxes. Mm -hmm. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great. That's a great <laughs> answer. I really like that answer. Yeah. I'm glad you like it. Yeah. Gil, Surge, any, any last thoughts before we bring this um, great episode to a close? I think a time capsule is a good place to call it. Hmm. Great. Well, Alex, on that note, let's, um, let's end our conversation for today or just pause it till a later time because I'm sure we'll have other opportunities in the future. Sure. I, ju I just wanted to say briefly, guys, thank you so much for having me. I felt completely welcomed. I felt... I felt listen to despite the rambling at times it's 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 wonderful this is uh you know this is a a, a nice little four-person community hey. that, that we've established here today the, the pleasure is all ours uh this was a great and really fun conversation we we went to a lot of different places and um everyone was quite engaged um so i'm i'm, I'm, I'm i'd love to be back i'd love to talk politics what you know there's a there's a <laughs> lot of directions we could go from here Sounds good. Well, let's keep in touch then and we'll figure something out in the, in, at some point in the future, maybe even near future, uh, if schedules permit. So uh, thanks, Alex. And, um, you know, as, as always, um, thanks uh, for our hundreds of thousands of listeners out there. Uh, <laughs> but, um, we have some interesting episodes coming up after this. So we'll post some more information about that um, at some point. But uh, Alex, uh, take care of yourself and, and um, Thanks again for being up here with us. Fantastic. Same to you guys. Gil, nice to meet you. Suraj, nice to see sure. you again. Good seeing you, Alex. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, guys.